welcome to 340B Insight from 340B Health. Hello from Washington, D.C., and welcome back to 340B Insight, the podcast about the 340B drug pricing program. I'm David Glendinning with 340B Health. Our guest today is Stephen Miller, 340B Health's Vice President of Pharmacy Services. The annual recertification process for 340B hospitals starts a little more than a week from now. We wanted to hear from Steve about what's new this year and revisit some of the best practices for navigating the process that he shared with us last year. Before we discuss recertification, I encourage you to catch up on some of the latest research that 340B Health has released in recent weeks. One of the studies showed that despite experiencing sharp decreases in their operating margins in 2020 due to the COVID-19 pandemic, 340B hospitals increased the amount of uncompensated and unreimbursed care they provided to patients. A second study analyzed Medicare data to show that patients seeking care at 340B hospitals are significantly more likely to have low incomes, to be disabled, or to identify as Black than those seeking care at non-340B hospitals and physician offices. Taken together, the data further demonstrate that 340B hospitals continue to fulfill the intent of the program by serving the patients most in need, the researchers concluded. You can find links to both studies in the show notes. And now I'm joined by 340B Health, Vice President of Pharmacy Services, Stephen Miller. Steve, welcome back to 340B Insight. Thank you, David. Glad to be here. Steve, we are bringing you on the show today because 340B recertification starts next week. We are going to be sharing your conversation with Miles Goldman from last year on best practices for hospitals navigating the recertification process. But Before we do, can you update us on what is new this year for the recertification process? Absolutely. Uh, One of the things that is new this year that uh, HRSA has changed the dates a little bit on when hospital recertification is going to run. It's going to start on August the 24th, which is a Wednesday, and it will end on Monday, September 19th at midnight Eastern time. In addition... There are two things that I want to talk just briefly about that are a little bit different with recertification this year. And the first one of those concerns the Medicare cost report uh, data that hospitals need to check what is already in the system when they open up recertification for the parent site the first time. Two years ago, HRSA removed the requirement for hospitals to go through each of those data elements before they would submit recertification, and they did that because of the relaxation in the filing dates that uh, CMS put into place for filing those cost reports due to the COVID pandemic. But this year, they are reinstating that requirement for hospitals to check those boxes, if you will, checking the qualifying data elements that is reflected in their last filed cost report. And we think this is a good thing because uh, there have been a number of hospitals cited for errors in that data because the system allowed them to submit their recertification the last two years without actually forcing them to look at those fields and make any necessary changes. Of course, hospitals have to be ready to um, provide the supporting documentation for any changes they make in the Medicare cost report information. So they need to have handy the worksheets A, C, E, Part A, and S2. Those are specific data elements that support the Medicare cost report items that are uh, that we're talking about. The second item really affects a very small number of hospitals, but it's those hospitals that have qualified for 340B due to the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2022. And just to recap, um, hospitals that filed a cost report recently with a less than uh, dish adjustment percentage that qualifies for 340B, then HRSA has a process in place to submit an attestation if that drop in percentage was due to COVID. 
And once that's submitted and HRSA approves it, they're reinstated to the 340B program. But their last cost report has a number, a dish percentage number that's less than the qualifying number. And so they want those hospitals to enter the actual cost report dish percentage number, say it's 9%, but the qualifying threshold is 11.75, they should enter the 9% during recertification. And that way their data will match and there won't be a discrepancy. So that's kind of an important little thing for a small number of hospitals. Okay. So a few changes this year, but certainly very important ones. And Steve, if you had a single piece of advice for hospitals that are about to head into this recertification season coming up, what would that be? Well, that's a great question. Certainly, hospitals need to prepare in advance of when the recertification period opens on August the 24th. And so the first thing hospitals can do to prepare for recertification this year is to watch our webinar on August the 17th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. And we will go through all the steps that you need to look into and all the data elements and documents that you need to pull together. But In addition to that, you also need to have your authorizing official and primary contact check their login information and have available all of those documents that we are going to go through in our webinar on the 17th. Also on our uh, website for 340B Health members, we have a resource dedicated to recertification. That's a really handy tool for you to review, and we'll be talking about some other things in our webinar that might be helpful for you as you go through the process. Well, Steve, thank you for uh, joining us to provide those updates and that advice. And now here is Miles Goldman's uh, conversation with Steve last year about the tried and true best practices for hospital recertification. Thank you, David. I'm joined by Steve Miller. To ensure everyone listening is on the same page, what is the purpose of the recertification process? I often remind myself to think about what is the source of truth when I'm thinking about a particular topic and how it relates to compliance and those kinds of things. So with 340B things, we often think of the 340B statute as that source of truth, and that certainly is the case with recertification. The statute describes a method that the Health and Human Services Secretary was instructed to implement, and that is now what we call recertification. But the purpose of it is really to confirm or validate that the covered entity's eligibility and accuracy of the information in the Office of Pharmacy Affairs database is complete and accurate. HRSA also uses that for the covered entities to make a pledge of their compliance with all 340B program requirements. I like that term, the the source of truth. It sounds like something sort of out of like uh, Star Wars or something like that. Yeah, we could call it the sword of truth too, I guess. (laughs) (laughs) So the real purpose is to just make sure that they're following program compliance, right? Right, that they're eligible, they continue to be eligible, and that their information is accurate and that they are compliant. How should hospitals be preparing for recertification and when should they start? Well, really, they should start when they enroll in the program and register their hospital and child sites as participating in 340B. But you have to do this every year. So a good place to start is by looking at your policies and procedures and making sure that your operations, your day-to-day 340B operations, align really closely with what you have written down in your policies and procedures. After that, the most critical thing that hospitals can do is to make sure that all of their information that is listed in the Office of Pharmacy Affairs Information System, or OPACE, is complete and accurate. And pay special attention to things like qualification information, eligibility information, demographic information, so addresses, names, phone numbers, contact information, and the Medicaid exclusion file. Secondly, recertification also requires a lot of documentation if you make any changes or updates during the recertification. So you want to gather all those first before you actually open up recertification tasks to get started. Remember, recertification is the action of confirming that that everything is right. It really shouldn't be about making routine changes because the quarterly registration periods are really designed for that. 
What are the eligibility criteria that hospitals must meet for recertification? Well, there's there's a list of things, Miles, and uh, we'll we'll just touch on those lightly. But first of all, all hospitals that are participating in 340B have to be nonprofit hospitals. If they are a for-profit corporation, they cannot participate in 340B by definition in the statute. Secondly, nonprofit hospitals can be either public hospitals, so they're owned or operated by the government, or they can be private hospitals. If they are a private hospital, they have to have a contract with a unit of local or state government to provide health care services to those individuals, low-income individuals, who don't qualify for Medicaid or Medicare services. Next, all hospitals, except for critical access hospitals, have to meet or exceed a disproportionate share adjustment percentage, which is on their Medicare cost report, and they want to be using the one that was last filed. For DISH, cancer, and children's hospitals, they have to exceed 11.75%. For rural referral centers and sole community hospitals, they can equal or exceed 8% of that adjustment percentage to qualify. And as I said, you know, the critical access hospitals are exempt from that requirement. All hospitals and child sites that are participating in 340B must have reimbursable outpatient costs and charges on that last filed cost report. And of course, we've already mentioned that this is about compliance. So HRSA is expecting the authorizing official who makes the submission for recertification to promise or pledge that they're going to be compliant with all 340B program requirements. Once recertification opens, either the primary contact or the authorizing official will log in to OPACE and open up their dashboard and then look at their tasks. And there will be a recertification task pending. Once the primary contact or the authorizing official opens that recertification task, they want to find and check the parent hospital site first. And it's really important to start with the parent site in recertification because once they make all of the changes or updates or confirm that everything is correct in the demographic information about the hospital and the qualification information, that will all transfer to all of the associated child sites. So they won't have to do it for each one. If you don't start with the parent, then you're going to have to do it for each one, and it'll take much, much longer. So after checking the demographic information, then they want to check the qualification information. And this is super important. You need to take that last filed cost report and make sure that all of the qualification information on the Medicare cost report matches what is in OPACE. You cannot depend on the upload from CMS to go to OPACE and to make all that information match at the time of recertification. It might or it might not, but don't even pretend that it might. Just automatically look at it and make sure that those fields all match. So we're talking about the DISH percentage. We're talking about the Medicare cost report filing date, the Medicare cost reporting period, the control type and classification type for the hospital. All of those things are on your Medicare cost report and they must match in recertification. Because if they don't, and you get an audit six months from now, and you submit that information from your last cost report, and it doesn't match what you attested to in recertification, you're going to get a finding. It's just important to do that right off the bat. Next, you want to make sure that you check all of your other information for each child site after completing the parent site and make sure that that is accurate as well. Steve, if the hospitals find that the information doesn't match on their Medicare cost report, what can they do? If it doesn't match, the most important thing that they would do in recertification is to make the changes in the recertification task, and then the system will prompt them to upload the supporting documentation, whether that's certain worksheets from the Medicare cost report that is showing, okay, the recertification default is showing a dish percentage of 15%, but our last cost report is 18.3%. So even though it's not a change in eligibility, it is still a discrepancy between the last cost report and what is showing up in OPACE. So they would change it to match what's in the last cost report. And then they would upload that worksheet that shows that figure. 
The important thing also to remember is during recertification, the traditional change request process is locked for hospitals who are recertifying until after the recertification is approved by HRSA. So they can't go in and make routine changes. They would have to make all of those changes to anything that is not correct during the recertification process. Let's talk about the Medicaid exclusion file. Why is this a critical component of the recertification process? The Medicaid exclusion file really ties back again to the statute. So the 340B statute has a requirement for the secretary to implement a mechanism for covered entities and other stakeholders to be able to prevent duplicate discounts. And that's where a manufacturer provides the 340B price. A Medicaid agency is submitting a rebate for the same drug billed to Medicaid. The Medicaid exclusion file process of validating that information in recertification is an important part because it has such a big consequence if it's wrong. So a manufacturer can be harmed by paying the discount twice and the hospital is non-compliant if they don't have the information in there correctly. You mentioned the uh, authorizing official a little earlier. Uh, can you explain further uh, about the importance of the AO? The uh, authorizing official is really the most important person from the covered entity or the hospital participating in 340B because they are the one person, the only person, who can do all of these things in terms of a final way. They have to have legal authority to bind the hospital or the covered entity in matters with the government. When they receive tasks or notifications from HRSA, they have to respond to those. The primary contact can enter information, they can make changes, they can submit comments on things in OPACE, but only the authorizing official can submit those to HRSA for approval or finalizing whatever the item is, including change requests. Do hospitals ever fail? to be recertified? And what are the most common reasons if, if this occurs? There are some hospitals every year that do not recertify. Fails is a little bit of a hard word there because sometimes it's just a natural consequence because they no longer qualify. That is the predominant reason is their eligibility dish percentage has dropped on their cost report that has just been filed just before recertification starts. The other reason it can be a change in their uh, type. So if they are purchased, they're a nonprofit hospital that's purchased by a for-profit corporation and they are no longer a nonprofit hospital, then they would no longer qualify. That is another reason that some hospitals do not recertify. There are a very, very, very small number who just don't get all the information done on time. And then they have to work one-on-one -on -one with HRSA to complete it. And sometimes HRSA will allow them to go on and recertify late, or sometimes they have to wait out a quarter and re-enter the next quarter. Through any of the examples you just provided there, if the hospital is no longer eligible for 340B, when is their next opportunity to become eligible again? Well, it, it depends on the reason that they drop. If it is eligibility that's tied to the Medicare cost report and their next cost report is not filed for another 12 months, then it's going to be 12 months plus another quarter, because once they register, then they, it's not effective until the following quarter. What are some of the most common errors hospitals make during recertification? And what are some of the best practices to avoid those? The most common error that I hear from our members is that the primary contact or the authorizing official didn't check every single one of those qualification requirements. So the dish percentage, the Medicare cost report filing date, or the cost reporting period, the control type, any one of those things, or classification type. If they just think that it, if it's defaulted in, that it has to be right, but it isn't always. Something has changed or they filed an amended cost report, which has changed one of those numbers. So it's just really, really important to check that information based on what 
the last cost report is, including if there was an amended cost report filed. The second thing is, is just double checking. So two sets of eyes is a really good best practice here for recertification. The primary contact goes in and looks at everything first, makes any changes, comments, submits that to the authorizing official, and then the authorizing official reviews it again, making sure that everything is right. And that seems to work really well for hospitals. If after recertification is completed and HRSA has approved it, the next best practice is to go back into OPACE and check that everything saved correctly. Because we've heard from a few hospitals that they thought they made the change, but they didn't take a screenshot and that's another best practice. Take a screenshot of every single page as you go through it, and particularly if you make changes, so you have something to go back to. And then if it didn't save, then you have something you can take to HRSA and say, look, here's a screenshot as we went through it, and it shows the different number, and now it doesn't show that number that we changed it to. And they can help work through you know, fixing those kinds of things. If a hospital has questions about recertification, what should they do? Well, certainly they should go to our website and look at all the resources that we have on our website at 340bhealth.org. There are a number of these resources and member tools. There's actually even a section for recertification and registration, which registration and recertification are really closely tied together. Secondly, if they have questions, they don't see the answers or they're not really sure they understand exactly what they need, they can reach out to us by email and set up a call with one of our staff experts. The info at 340bhealth.org is as good a place as any to send that email. That's an easy one. You don't have to know somebody's name. Certainly, you can reach out to me, but we have a number of staff that can answer these questions. I know this can be one of the more stressful times of the year for staff managing their 340B programs. So thank you, Steve, for taking the time today to help share best practices for successfully navigating 340B recertification. Oh, you're more than welcome, Miles. We're always available to help. Our thanks again to Steve Miller for the updates on this year's recertification and for all his advice for hospitals on navigating the process. If you are a 340B Health member and you missed our August 17th recertification webinar, you can access a recording of the event. Please visit the show notes to learn more. And our thanks to all of you who visited our podcast booth in the exhibit hall at the 340B Coalition Summer Conference earlier this month. We were so glad to meet more of our listeners. The first of several interviews we conducted in the booth with conference speakers and attendees will be coming out soon. So please subscribe to our podcast if you have not done so already. We will be back in a few weeks. As always, thanks for listening and be well. Thanks for listening to 340B Insight. Subscribe and rate us on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. For more information, visit our website at 340bpodcast.org. You can also follow us on Twitter at 340B Health and submit a question or idea to the show by emailing us at podcast at 340bhealth.org.